Call yourself ready. Stay focused. Green flag. Green flag. Be smooth. Take care of your stuff. Go, go, go. Take it again. Get out there. Get out. Get the hot shot here. Get the hot shot. Look at your bike. Whoever's doing it, look at your bike. Wreck behind you. Oh, you gotta go. Go low. Go low. Side out. Side. Watch it. Watch it. That's how we roll. What, man? I'm nervous. People behind you. When it's time to run him down. Let's go. Get it. Get that wheel. You are the man. Hell yeah. The Roman Coliseum of Racing, Bristol Motor Speedway in the hills of eastern Tennessee. This is the fifth race of the season, but the first ever for NASCAR's Car of Tomorrow. This has been a five to seven year project. They have been testing, researching, but we're going to have to get racing before we answer a lot of these questions. How will the best drivers in America take to their new wheels? Well, today you'll find out. The track is 50 years old, but in 2007, Bristol Motor Speedway saw the future of NASCAR. And as we incorporate the car tomorrow into the Nextel Cup Series this season, we expect that car to be safer. But we also expect it to produce the close competitive races that NASCAR fans have come to expect. And we also know that it'll help control car owner costs in the long haul. NASCAR set out to completely reimagine the most important piece of equipment in the sport and create the new car. For years, the car had a spoiler on the back. In the new car, the spoiler has been replaced by a rear wing. On the front of the new car, where the valence once was, there is now a splitter. The greenhouse is wider and the car is two inches taller. The new car is shorter by almost two inches, and between the wheels, it is an inch wider. The exhaust now exits the car on the right side, which is safer for the driver and the pit crew. And the new car has a lot of additional safety features, like a reinforced fuel cell compartment. There's more room for the driver. There's more headroom, there's more arm room. The window opening's bigger. The driver can get out quicker, easier with the head and neck restraint, which was a major problem with the old car. Longtime crew chief Fatback McSwain spent 15 years in NASCAR. He was just one of the people who took part in the long process of redesigning the stock car. When they really said, okay, we are going to do this. We are going to do this car. Uh, we started having uh, conference calls every Tuesday with all the teams and NASCAR and all the manufacturers. I think everyone was open and honest and, and they were able to take their feelings out of it and just honestly speak what they want. I mean, there were some heated discussions uh, on the conference calls sometimes and sometimes they were just smooth as silk. A lot of people said it's going to do this, it's going to do that. I, I, I really didn't build a judgment or even an opinion because you have preconceived notions, you're surprised. Jeff Burton drives the number 31 Chevy for Richard Childress Racing. Like every driver in NASCAR, he is adjusting to his new ride. You definitely have to drive it differently. There's some technique that, that's different, requires paying attention and trying to do it better. You, you know, it's so different, you can't drive it the same. It's heavier than what we used to run. It has a wing on it, but you know, it's a race car. It's, you know, it's not a spaceship. Well, I think what a driver wants out of any race car is handling and predictability. And so they need it so that when they want the car to turn, the car actually turns. Professor Deandra Leslie Pilecki is not a NASCAR driver, but she knows what she is talking about. For the past two years, she has put her physics background to work in the garage, writing a book on the physics of NASCAR. I happened to be clicking through stations, and I saw a race. There were about five or six cars going around a corner, and all of a sudden, one of them wiggled, and then it went right into the corner. And I didn't understand why one car would hit the wall and the other ones wouldn't. Two years later, here's the book. Her research has given her a good look at the new car and NASCAR's strict new inspection procedures. If you look at how they're doing the templating for the new car, so there's one main grid that fits over the car, 
There is a nose grid and there is a rear end grid. What that's done is incredibly constrain how much wiggle room the teams have. Some of the creative design work that you might would do as an individual team to gain an advantage, all those windows closed up uh, because the NASCAR specs just about every area of the chassis. Doug Richard has dealt with NASCAR's inspections since he became chief mechanic for Dale Earnhardt in 1980. You feel a lot of pressure? Uh, not, well, it's get, there's more pressure now, but I'm, I'm trying to put it aside. Uh, we're trying to win this championship this year. It'll be the first time a rookie has ever won Rookie of the Year and went on the next year to win the championship. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm tickled to death to be doing this job, you know, for that kind of situation. 25 years and a few teams later, Richard knows, even though NASCAR changes all the time, the shift to the new car will be a big challenge. Sometimes, you know, receptive to change. I'd say there was some, you know, doubt maybe that it would go through because it was so different. The way you build the cars, the way you race the cars, everything is different. I mean, be doing it like this for years and years and years, and now you're gonna have to do it like that. It's gonna be met with resistance. I heard drivers say too ugly to race. I heard drivers say there's no way we can drive these cars. I heard, you know, I heard crew chiefs say it's the stupidest thing ever. I mean, I, you know, I heard a lot, and you know, most of it was negative. Uh, I was saying like 1955 uh, taxi cab Chevy, maybe I, I'm somewhere around in there. I'd like them to change a little bit. I'd like them to make it a little bit easier for the guys on the on the, the crew, the crew chiefs to work on them. Man, I have to say it's a huge burden on our teams. You know, this is it's cost us a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of effort. I'm not sure that's totally the right direction. I understand a lot of the thinking behind it. Obviously, all the safety stuff, uh, everybody's for. So we need to back off a little bit, I think, and say, okay, we've got two tests on a car, and you're comparing it to a car that we've been running for the last 25 years. You know, it wasn't like changing the spoiler height or changing the restrictor plate. It was like, okay, take everything you knew and everything you've worked on for the past 50 plus years, ball it up, throw it in the trash, we're starting over. It's just change, man. Anytime you have major change to what people call normal, they fight it. Fighting change couldn't stop the new car. If that March day in Bristol proved anything, it was that races with the new car would be as thrilling as ever. Kyle Busch has drove away from this group. Burton in the 31 to the high side, they're gonna go all the way up to fourth right now. It's gonna be a nail biter, boys. Yes. Kyle Busch will always have the claim that he won the very first race, car tomorrow. I'm still not a very big fan of these things. I can't stand to drive them. They suck. Even the naysayers felt better about the new car after it raced 16 times in 2007. It isn't called the car of tomorrow anymore. For NASCAR, tomorrow has arrived. When Deandra Leslie Pilecki was researching her book, The Physics of NASCAR, she soon found out that the face of the sport is changing. NASCAR got its start in grimy garages filled with guys who got their education under a car. To succeed in NASCAR today, you have to be an engineer or a rocket scientist like Eric Warren of Michael Waltrip Racing. I did my PhD work at NC State in uh, aerospace engineering, focusing primarily on computational fluid dynamics, but uh, since then I've been working both experimental and computational aero work in racing. But what is computational fluid dynamics? Basically, computational fluid dynamics is just a study of fluid flow and solving the equations governing fluid flow numerically uh, using computers. Okay, so you started with rockets, but of course now you're working with race cars. Yeah. Building race cars in the 21st century requires a firm grasp of the laws of physics and concepts like aero. Aero is short for aerodynamics, and aero means air, and literally dynamics means motion. So aerodynamics is the study of the motion of air, and in NASCAR what we care about is how air moves over the car. The best way I can explain aero to anybody who knows nothing about it 
is roll your window down, going down the road at 60 miles an hour, and stick your hand out. It's the pressure of the air on the car. That pressure exerts different kinds of forces on a stock car. One of them is called downforce, and it helps keep the car on the track. Every race car, or even your car at home, you know, requires downforce. And, and you know, the faster you go, the more the car is getting pushed down because it's, it's making downforce. Downforce typically makes the car drive better. We use the air to push down and make the, make the tires heavier which holds the car in the corner easier and lets the driver stay in the gas longer. The more downforce you can get, the less the driver has to keep his foot off the gas, the more speed your motor makes. Over the years, NASCAR teams molded, shaped, and twisted their race cars in pursuit of more downforce. With the new car, NASCAR tried to get the aero and the teams back under control. What NASCAR said is, in, instead of trying to stuff the aerodynamics genie back into the bottle, let's just build a new bottle. And so what they did was they made the body a fixed shape. So you cannot change almost anything on the body in the new car. What you can change are the two new pieces, the wing that's in the back, and then there's a splitter in the front. When a stock car moves, air molecules hit the surface of the car. In the old car, front downforce came from the nose, the valence, and even a little from the hood. In the new car, the front splitter creates almost all the front downforce. Air then travels over the hood, hits the windshield, passes over the roof, and strikes the rear wing. In the new car, the majority of the rear downforce is created by air coming in contact with the wing. How do you adjust front downforce using the splitter? We got a couple different uh, ways. The main priority, the main adjustment is really the uh, amount that the splitter extends away from the front of the car. So from the furthest back position, it's basically four inches from the from the nose, and you can go out to six inches. And so you got two inches around the the arc of the splitter to give you more horizontal area. And the new car doesn't have near the arrow of the old car. It's so light on downforce from what we're used to, they're maxing out everything. And even though the balance is off a little bit, you can't really adjust it because it's so light. If you take it away, you're gonna be hurting. The splitter is exactly what it is. You can be four inches out or you can be six inches out. That's your window. There's no left to right. There's no raising or lower of the, of the headlight doors to create more downforce. We have what we have. You're pushing a bunch more air. I'm just wondering, yeah, I wonder if the cars... Yeah. Where the air used to go over these cars, it's not now. It's just it's 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 now. It's it's slamming it. Going over. NASCAR teams also try to maximize the car's side force. During the race, fast-moving air hits the sides of the car on the door and the quarter panels. That air helps the car turn. More side force basically helps give you that force that pushes the car around the corner. Anything can drive good going straight, but when it turns and it's in the corner, that's what side force is all about. So how your car generates side force has a huge influence on how the car drives. Well, what it does, it lets the driver run yawed out, is what we, mean, what we say, for a longer period of time because the air pushes the car back. So he can run the car looser and looser with a more side force. It looses fast. The way we always did it, we'd move the tail way over and bend the car kind of. They didn't want the cars bent, they wanted the car symmetrical and square. They flatten the car out, it's got a nice taller side, really, really flat on the sides to try and increase the side force. The theory is that the wing will create better side-by-side -side racing. The car makes a lot of side force from up high rather than down low. So if you're beside somebody, you can stay in the gas and run beside of them without getting the air sucked off of you, which potentially could make better side-by-side -side racing. Seven laps to go at New Hampshire. Denny Hamlin got to be loving this. Denny Hamlin running for his life right now at New Hampshire. Three car lengths ahead of Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon giving it all he's got right now. It all comes down to this. Halfway down the back straightaway, half a lap to go. Denny Hamlin drives deep into the corner. Gordon drives deeper. Gordon is there. They almost make contact, but Hamlin has the lane covered. Hamlin scores.
score its first win of the year here today at New Hampshire International Speedway. When NASCAR created the new car, one of the things that changed the most was the shape. For the teams and the crew chiefs, the new shape has been a big adjustment. It is a taller car, it's a wider car, and it's heavier. You just get a lot of roll out of these cars they're, because they're taller. So we don't have the, the control of stacking that 350 to 400 pounds of lead over on the left side like we used to. So that hurts us some. Because the new car is taller, the center of gravity is higher than it was in the old car. The location of the center of gravity has significant impact on the grip of a moving race car. When a car is sitting still, each of the four wheels supports the same amount of weight. When the driver accelerates, weight shifts from the front wheels to the rear wheels. Now the front wheels have less grip than the rear wheels. The same thing happens during cornering. In a turn, the grip on the outside tires increases and the grip on the inside tires decreases. How much weight shifts is directly proportional to the height of the center of gravity above the ground. And the center of gravity in the new car is significantly higher than the center of gravity was in the old car. What that means is that the grip changes a lot more. And that makes it a lot harder to handle. Cliff Boyer, who's currently being shown back in 32nd position in happy hour. And we showed you a moment ago, it's been a bit of a struggle just trying to get this car to turn here in the corner. I don't even know what to tell you. I mean, it's just all over the place. It's loose, tight, no grip. That's a frustrated driver right there. I can't really tell what kind of grip I got. Because it's so bouncy, it's sliding around a little bit, both ends of the car are. We worked hard on cars, keeping the weight really, really low. Low light, light low and left. That was always the saying. The higher you raise the center of gravity, the easier the car wants to roll over. The higher center of gravity is not the only reason that the new car is harder to handle than the old car. The new car also has less travel. Movement of the body in relation to the wheels. In the old car, when drivers braked in a turn, the car went into the hound dog position, nose down and tail up. The car could travel about four inches and the change in attitude produced more downforce. Travel on the new car is limited by rules regulating splitter heights. So the travel in the new car is only about two inches, half as much as the old car. The car doesn't change attitude nearly as much as it used to, so there is less downforce and less grip. You know, the only thing is that the car just doesn't have as much grip, uh, and with the less travel that the car goes through, you just can't drive in as deep. You know, if you drive in deep, it really upsets the car. The limited front end travel that we get, we have a lot of camber, makes the car real turny, but yet uh, the car has a higher center of gravity, so it doesn't want to turn as good. So it wants to turn, but yet it doesn't. Maybe in the future, you know, we could get some help from NASCAR in the, in the sense that maybe let us travel these cars just a little bit more. A half inch would go miles. This thing is still in its infancy. We have a lot we have to learn about it. As time progresses, we're going to have much better opinions um, and ideas on how we should make the cars better. But I think we're too, it's too young to figure that out right now. NASCAR had a lot of reasons for building the new car. They wanted to reduce costs to keep smaller teams in the sport. But the most important reason for the new car was safety. On board with Casey King. There's the move. Hello. Casey King trying to thread the needle, had nowhere to go because Kurt Busch's car just abruptly slid right across in front of him in case he had cars to his outside. Safety has always been a top priority. From the restrictor plate to the Hans device, NASCAR always embraces technology to better protect drivers. But technology has evolved so much in the past few decades, it was time for an overhaul.
There's a lot of features that make the new car a lot safer. The old car was really pretty good about front and rear end crashes, and they had designed the car so that it would collapse strategically. Holy cow. He's fine. But what was really a concern was what happens if a driver gets T-boned in the driver's side door. And so they totally redid the doors. In the new car, the chassis bars that form the driver's side door are now graduated. In a side impact, the graduated door bars will collapse sequentially, which softens the impact. There is also a steel plate in the door which prevents debris from entering the greenhouse. The door is also filled with an innovative new foam, which is designed to better absorb energy in an impact. When you say you hear foam, you normally think something like a sponge, so you think something soft. And it turns out imp this impact is actually pretty hard. It doesn't really behave like a sponge. If you had a spongy type of foam in the car, the sponge would collapse and then it would come out again. So basically you'd be storing energy as you compress the foam, but then that energy would be coming out again. What you really want to make a driver safe is you want to absorb energy. And that's why the impacts is so useful, is it's an energy absorbing foam. The foam is safer because it is closed cell foam, which absorbs more energy than an open cell foam. Open cell foam is squishy and soft. An outside force can easily push air out of an open cell foam. So the foam compresses and temporarily stores the incoming energy. When the force is removed, the open cells recapture the air and the foam bounces back. In closed cell foam, the cells aren't connected to each other, so they can't release air unless they are broken. Collapsing the closed cells dissipates energy. When the force is removed, the foam doesn't bounce back. It stays contracted. Watch the wall give, actually, with the energy and absorb energy right there. Well, that wall really jumped back out of the way, and I completely forgot about the energy absorbing foam in the driver's side door. So the wall helped, the foam helped. And you can see Kyle Petty just as fresh as a daisy getting out of the car. It's be just fine. The energy that you use to deform the foam, to crush it, is energy that isn't passed along to the driver. And the most important thing about collisions is dissipating the energy anywhere except the driver. The foam did have one problem if it wasn't installed properly. Foam caught on fire in the right side door, so I guess blaming it on something else is probably, uh, probably not the right thing to do. I mean, this thing just started burning up, so it's almost turning into a joke now. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. The smoldering foam has been taken care of. And thanks to the new car, all the drivers in NASCAR are safer. When the 2008 season begins, NASCAR's long road to the new car comes to an end. Now it is the only car. Every team is looking forward to making the car of tomorrow into the car of today. I think the teams are gonna be a lot happier this year that they're only running one car because going back and forth, it was confusing for the drivers, it was confusing for the crew chiefs and the mechanics. And I think this year they get to focus all their energy and all their resources on making this car as fast as they possibly can. We had so many parts and pieces, we had so many different cars, we were doing things so many different ways and we're having to stock two different styles of everything. Let's just do it, learn it, make the best of it. Wore the guys out. It, it put tons of hours on everybody. It wore out the pocketbooks of all the owners. It was a tough, hard, long year, and I think that everyone now is ready, whatever car it is, if it's a bug or if it's a Cadillac or if it's a car tomorrow, they want one car and one car all year long. The new car has arrived. Crew chiefs and technical directors still worry about aero and grip and center of gravity, while drivers concentrate on something else, winning.